This week in disc golf saw Missy Gannon get her first major victory winning the USWDGC. Nico promotes the women's game in his own way. Philo's post has some in the community questioning if that million dollar tournament is a scam and so much more. What's going on, all you disgenerates? Disc Golf World, Jefferson, the minivan, and me, Swiss Cheese, you know the one with all the holes in his game, are currently in Houston for the Texas States. You're watching This Week in Disc Golf, where we cover all things disc golf from the past week. I want to start off and acknowledge the Disc Golf World surpassed 20,000 subscribers. Truly, I want to thank every one of you who have subscribed. Because of your efforts, we have taken this channel to heights I couldn't imagine ever hitting, let alone in such a short time. It's surreal to believe going all in on disc golf and working our ass off. We've experienced such success, a community that supports us, some great tournaments, an epic journey across the U.S. with my nephew, and even being made fun of by Jay Redding himself. Guys, I truly can't express just how much I appreciate all of your support, and we promise to continue to put out the best content we can for the next 20,000 and beyond. I do a far better job talking about disc golf and wasted enough time, so let's jump in. In some news off the Pro Tour, Philo Brathwaite made a Facebook post announcing that he will be doing post-commentary for the SC SCX Disc Golf, a nationwide team challenge with 10,000 competitors who will be battling in over $4 million in prize money and a $1 million payout to the winning team. To say the least, many in the community had questions surrounding the post, most first reactions being why the longest acronym in the sport and what exactly it stood for immediately followed by checking the date to see if Philo was pulling an April Fool's joke. Deservedly so, as this would become the highest total prize pool in disc golf. It would be over 12 times as much as last year's and current record holder $322,000 purse for the DGBT Championship. That's over $3.5 million more than that. And the fact that it's open to any level disc golfer. Those are some head-turning numbers and many felt it was too good to be true. With those numbers, many would suspect sponsors and a far larger promotion. To say the least, the post had people heading to the link to get further details, which for most, it provided little answers. It loosely discusses the format, team structure, the regional breakdown by map, team sign-up page, and a note that further details will be provided once a thousand teams sign up, giving some reason enough to call it a scam and accuse the founders of taking the money and trying to run faster than P. Diddy's private jet. It was kind of giving me a headache and even more questions than answers. So for my sanity and the community, I went looking for the answers that we all wanted. Hit them up on their contact page and asked to discuss the format, what the hell SCSCX Disc Golf stands for, and if this is real or not. Well, I came up with this idea 20-something years ago. I'm the founder, Donald Leslie. The SCSX stands for Square Circle Square X. That's it. That's just the APA is kind of close to what I would like to do with the, from disc golf. And nobody came up and spent 20 years. So I was like, well, you know, I need to go ahead and make it happen. And so that's what I did. The whole thing about disc golf, period. Getting out there in the woods with your friends and having a good time. Having a team. Yeah, the team yeah. aspect of it. Our mission here at SCX, SCX Disc Golf Club is to provide a fair, competitive environment. And you want to make gender can play disc golf on a 10-person team year-round from beginner level to pro level. 40%, an amazing 40% of all players will earn some cash, and one team will earn a million dollars. Basically, you have nine match sessions, four nine match sessions per year. You have winners of each division that will qualify for the end of the year tournament. For each nine week, nine match session, you're going to have a qualifier, one qualifier for each division. It's all regional based. You only play your division. You okay. never travel. You play those 10 teams. Every time. When they sign up, they put in three courses that they would play at. And then we'll do a Red Robin. They would never play out of those courses once we set them. And then Division One will play Division Two, And that winner will come to Raleigh. You know who you're playing every week for like that first nine times, right? Whoever is at the top of the card, they put up first. You might put up a pro. Other team will put up. They might put up a beginner. So the pro's got to beat the beginner by the point system. Match play, been able to get to play against higher ranked players and see how you feel is. And Turns out the founders have been in disc golf for over 20 years and matching a similar format that they've experienced in another sport pool. Felt there was a format that could be brought over to disc golf and hit the ground running. and Provided some more detailed answers to the sandbagging concerns, dollars among others. In order to make things play as fair as possible, we got this point system. After the first nine match session, the point system should take care of any initial sandbaggers. But after that, we should everybody have pretty people pretty well uh, ranked. Like 
on our scorecards, you have a plus minus of how much you won and lost by. And we have a certain spot that we want, to, you know, when people get to, we'll make sure they move up. Oh, yeah. This golf is just so huge. The, yeah. the communities are like, they're, they're sleeper communities because, like, a lot of people aren't signed up for PDGA or anything like that. So you really don't know how big it is until you go out. What we're thinking is, you know, this first year, once we get, you know, we need 10,000, 1,000 teams, 10,000 players to, to launch the league play. And once this first year gets completed, next year it could be 20,000. Who knows? Depending on, on the on the demand. The biggest need really is for sponsors to help cover players' fees throughout the year. We're looking for, like, major sponsors to help pay for teams and stuff. So we're out looking for these sponsors to help pay back to the people. If anybody's a fan of disc golf, sponsor a team for a year for like 6000 and that covers all 10 players for the whole year. You know, and you get your logo on their jersey and uh, whatever other advertising we can give them on our website, whatever. Give them whatever they, we can do, you know, that's fair. And our website, www.scxdg.com. Look, this is a concept that sounds great. An exciting chance to give great disc golfers who don't have the luxury to tour an easier opportunity than a Q-Series. This could also help expose so many non-PDGA members towards competition, possibly new people to the sport, and in all honesty, too ambitious. It's a daunting project and a concept that I understand gives people pause and question just how off the ground this idea will go. Yet this sport was created by dreamers who made up a game throwing a plastic disc that went global turned into a professional sport with a tour. It's up to the community and their desired participation to decide. Beth at 69. I just told myself, you've got to will this one in there. Whatever you have, just will it in there. This man is unbelievable. This is what athletes live for. This is the moment. This week, the sport had the first major of the season, the USWDGC. And when talking about majors in the FPO, Kristen Tatar's name and game is not far behind. She's taken down every major she's attended since the devastating loss at Champions Cup in 2022. Most following the FPO game and those who don't know of Tatar and her dominance, especially at majors. Raising the expectations to repeat with another major sweep, despite Tatar admittedly dealing with injury and fatigue. Tatar went into the tournament and fans did not witness her great play as she never got control of her game, the course, or the tournament itself. Surprising was just how far off the lead Tatar was. Never being on lead card three out of the four days of the event. She had finished in sixth place with her lowest finish ever on the Pro Tour, opening the door to the remainder of the competition. That player to walk through that door consistently in big moments has been big game Missy Gannon who despite taking down two DGBT championships and some of the highest paydays, had yet to win a major in her career. That was until this last weekend, as she only led from start to finish to win on the difficult track. Though the win may not have been as much of a dominating performance or a jaw-dropping highlight, instead dominating in classic golf fashion, with her consistency in hitting fairways, limiting mistakes, and of course her putting. It's far time from her needing to be more recognized as one of the best FPO players currently in the game. Evelina Salonen, who fans only want to discuss her putt, are ignoring the fact she has a win, another podium with a second place at a major, a top 5, and a top 10 on this short year. That's a very impressive start. Even if her putt from outside 30 feet gets higher from the pocket than the DGBT volunteer running the parking lot. Valerie Mondahanu was able to edge out Owen Scoggins for the solo third place finish for her second podium finish at USWDGC event in her short career. Spectating the USDGC weekend in person for the third year in a row, you get to experience the camaraderie and positivity for all participating members. The event showcased 21 divisions from amateur to pro and under 10 to 75 and older age divisions. As much as each participating competitor is competing amongst each other, there's a greater purpose to expand female disc golf in participation and exposure to males and more importantly, to women and little girls who have yet to play the sport. This year saw record-breaking payouts awarding 46 women with over $1,000 prize cash payouts, the most ever in a single event. All positive messaging and certainly what disc golf needs to grow the sport universally. Yet the FPO game and its growth financially is dependent on the entire field and men to consume your product. 
which seems to be the mountain that USWDGC and nearly all women's sports needs to climb. I will say the out loud part. When your event is the premier event for the weekend, maybe a better way to showcase the FPO athletes is on a more scorable course. I'm all for challenging pros, yet when only 8% of your field is scoring par or better for the women's event, it seems to give validation to those that say the women's game is a lesser product. Yes, the weather was bad for three of the four days. Some would go farther and highlight the best weather saw the best scoring of the tournament, and in better conditions, certainly would have saw better scoring. Yet, over the past two USWDGC events, less than 20% of the field finished even for the tournament a far departure from the 2022 contest where nearly 60% of the field shot below par. What has changed in the past three years? One only needs to look at the developments in course design as the past USWDGCs have been on recently newly designed courses. And specifically, how these courses depict the difficult position the sport finds itself when it comes to the women's game. Look, I have nothing against the course. It is superb and enjoyed it immensely while playing. The amount of work that has been put into this course was immense and should be celebrated. Sprinkle Valley is an incredible location and is one of the best venues already that I have been to and certainly will be featured at future DGBT stops as the course continues to season. The course is built around a large brewery venue, the Austin Beer Works, with more than enough room inside and out with a large beer garden outdoors, which allows spectating in the person with a card or grabbing some tacos and beer and watching along on screen. Following the success of the event, the Open at Austin, the Sprinkle Valley course, and Harvey Pennock course, with the city of Austin being the backdrop, Austin is primed to become a future Elite Plus four-day event featuring two courses, and once it is announced, immediately becomes one of the best destination stops on tour from my own experiences. But it would be foolish to think that the course design at the Sprinkle Valley certainly didn't have that in mind on top of building a course for all who play, which is overwhelmingly male dominant. The design needed to challenge not only the incoming FPO major, but the future DGBT stops and incoming MPO pros. That is the problem when there are not FPO specifically designed courses instead of shortening distances with different tee pads or pin locations on shared courses. The MPO side of the game has seen drastic changes at a far faster rate than the FPO game in its entirety in such a few years. The game has exploded with large contracts and the rise of younger talent that has progressed the sport to new heights, especially when it comes to skills and arm talent as the game has more and more players competing for wins every week. Unlike the FPO, who despite seeing the most individual winners last season, still saw an individual dominate the field on the season and winning every major including nearly every tournament they participated in. The FPO division has seen a slower participation in large part because it got a later start than the MPO and have battled for space ever since. With this player skill progression in the MPO game, spectators are demanding more difficult tracks to truly challenge the best players in the MPO. This has resulted in demands for longer course layouts, tighter, more difficult gaps, and the most challenging courses that can be designed. We've already seen it on tour already with the addition of three new course layouts already on the short schedule and consistent hole tinkering. With course design's main focus being to challenge or beat those elite MPO talents and the FPO sharing the space on these courses, the FPO game has become more difficult and scores have been impacted. This has created a widening scoring gap across the entire field as fewer players are able to score consistently on these more difficult courses, arguably damaging the optics of the FPO product and possibly the game. While if you look at some FPO design solo courses, they are not only still challenging but allow the ladies more opportunities to score. You only need to look at FPO tracks in Sunset Hills at Ledgestone and Brock Park at this week's stop, where there is a separate course. Both have seen better scoring and a larger percentage of the field at par or better than the past two USWDGC events. That and the Wildflower Tour in Austin has seen plenty of success for lower divisions also. My hopes are we as a sport can recognize and progress faster than allowing time to solve these discrepancies through FPO specific design courses created by women in the sport. And in some best case scenarios, their own space would certainly elevate the play, possibly the participation, and provide a far better product in my opinion. Is there a solution apart from allowing the FPO to catch up for a lack of better terms? Maybe not. Yet from a product consumption and a standpoint, I believe better scoring in the FPO as a whole provides a better product.
This week, Nicola Castro went to his socials to promote not only his new disc release, but also expressing his belief surrounding the current FPO game and PDGA's inclusion of trans athletes in the sport, and the most heated debate in disc golf since last year's lawsuits. Unlike most on each side of the debate, Nico is putting his money where his mouth is by giving some of his proceeds from his latest disc release, The Seed, sales to pay out any female disc golfer who lost out on cashing at a tournament due to Natalie Ryan. Choosing not only to announce this during USWDGC week, but also vending the event at the Fly Mart. Similar to any conversation on the topic, the move has both been celebrated and panned. Some have viewed this as catering to a base to sell discs, while others herald the move and purchase the new putter. At the very least, it gets everyone to stop talking about the time it takes Nico to putt, and more about how the f*** they have lavender smelling discs now. One thing's for sure, no one can take away the fact that Nico has made a stand in a sport where few pros are willing to speak with conviction. And now... Let's move on to some quick hitters. Drew Gibson gets body shamed in Disc Golf's Me Too movement. Not sure how to take this post. I just know I'm here for it. Gavin Babcock loses the sport challenge where the winner picks the loser's photo, superimposing his central college wrestling photo that screams he and Big Red are going to go take down the local food challenge. Kevin Kiefer III not only lost two discs in the water bunker, but also his shirt during the practice round, showing he's been hitting the gym as much as Ezra and Turner. Those who are wondering where Jordan Castro is, he's on a 12-month probation. Oh, and Berdogi got a new logo if you haven't seen that. And also, Kayla Visca sells the preserve to gotta go, gotta throw to free himself up for more family time. And guys, that wraps up this week in disc golf. If you're attending the Texas States, be on the lookout for the two of us. Come say what's up. We always enjoy talking to fans, and we only try to look busy. If you have stayed this long, thank you and pat yourself on the back. And if you aren't subscribed, make sure to do so. While you're at it, like, comment, and share. And if you want more, check out all the previous episodes and all the content we continue to pump out.